Welcome to Behavioral Groups. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. This is the podcast that explores why we do what we do using the lens of applied behavioral science. We speak with great researchers and great authors around the world, and we have fun with pretty much every conversation we have. Yes, yes, we do. This one was an exception. It might be one of those that rises into the top 10 of all time. Without a doubt. Our guest is Rory Sutherland. Rory is the vice chairman of Ogilvy Group, executive creator director of Ogilvy One. He also co-founded Ogilvy's behavioral sciences practices, and he writes an occasional column for The Spectator called The Wiki Man. He is also the author of a new book called Alchemy, The Dark Art and Curious Science of Creating Magic in Brands, Business, and Life. Classic underachiever. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and we need to say that both Tim and I loved this book and that we both highly, highly recommend it. Absolutely. We loved it so much it made our top 10 book list of 2019. Top nine book list, because oh, I think we both said true. this was our top in our top ten, so there was only nine. That's there we right. go. It was that good. Uh, it's super insightful and super entertaining, and we hope that you get a sense of it by listening to this podcast, because the discussion that we had with Rory, you'll see why you need to go out and get this book immediately. Don't hesitate. Run! Get this book right away. (laughs) Uh, In our discussion with Rory, we covered a whole variety of topics. Capitalism, advertising, ergodicity. What What does ergodicity even mean? Well, we'll we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Some of his best ideas from alchemy, too, like the opposite of a good idea might be a good idea. Okay. All right. I I just Googled ergodicity. All right. (laughs) Ergodicity. Ergodicity. See, I don't even know how to pronounce it. The definition of ergodicity from Merriam Webster. One, of or relating to a process in which every sequence or sizable sample is equally representative of the whole, or two, involving or relating to the probability that any state will reoccur, especially uh, having zero probability that any state will never reoccur. Wow. Yeah. So I still don't know what it means, but we're going to go in and we're going to find out. All right. Okay. So, so with that out of the way, we also want to let you know about an exciting new podcast that Tim and I are working on. So, Tim, do you want to talk about this? Do you oh, want me sure. To? Throw me under the bus. Yes. Go <laughs> it's, for it. Well, it's going to be called Weekly Grooves. Weekly Grooves. What a unique name. <laughs> <laughs> and the point of, of the weekly grooves is to have a weekly podcast that applies the behavioral lens to primarily business culture, but really kind of anything that's going on that week. Yeah, in, in that topic of the moment or that, that time, and we're going to be taking a behavioral lens to things that are going on in the world around us. And Articles, we're going to, n- news pieces, yeah, uh, we're gonna groove published on papers. Those. Yeah, any, anything that's happening in the world that we think is, is relevant and meaningful to bring a behavioral lens to, we'll be talking about it that week. And it'll be a short one, so it's not going to be a long interview format. No, it'll no, be a short one, but yes. you can get your behavioral fix for the week. Definitely. And it'll be coming out shortly and hopefully in the next week or two. So that's uh, right. keep, keep starting, tuned. And- starting in January of 2020. 2020. All right. So with that, sit back with a fine, fresh pour of ergodicity and enjoy (laughs) our conversation with Rory Sutherland. Rory Sutherland, welcome to the Behavioral Grooves podcast. It's a joy to be here. We would like to start with a little speed round. All right. Grief. Oh, yeah. These These are easy, though, for you. So... Coffee or tea? Uh, Entirely depends on the time of day. Um, My wife and I have a huge row about whether you have coffee first and then tea in the morning or (laughs) vice versa. And we've never really settled that one. The only thing I would say is I tend to start the day with a coffee. And then at any point in the day where I've had enough coffee, I switch to tea. So it's Um, not a particular time. It's just a level of coffeeness. It's context and path dependent. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think it's fair to say. And there is a very interesting finding on coffee versus tea, which is if you ask people after a meal, typically after lunch or dinner, do you want tea or coffee? The majority of people ask for coffee because it's the default. If you bring along a menu, however, with different kinds of tea, yeah, so you can choose Darjeeling or fresh peppermint or whatever, the majority of people have tea. 
<laughs> so so it's a fantastic tea or coffee in itself is a fantastic example of where choice architecture really has an effect on the final choice. <laughs> Fascinating. So would you prefer life without a mobile phone or life without a laptop? Uh, without the mobile phone, oddly. I'd, I'd be in a minority there. Um, it would be awkward because I would then have to open my laptop on the street and attempt to connect to people. Um, but, um, I'm actually doing this call. One of the things I don't understand particularly about young people is their obsession with small screens. And my children will do things like try and book flights on something which is essentially <laughs> smaller than the human hand. Now, I'm doing this call, okay? The best reason to buy a 4K TV is nothing to do with movies, films, or anything else. It's that you can plug a laptop into it and have a James Bond villain-sized monitor. Okay. So, so our heads are huge in your office, right there. Oh, enormous! That... Enormous! It, you're, you're like a Stalin-era sculpture to me. Yeah. Oh my absolutely. gosh! I'm sorry. I am sorry for that. <laughs> it is our sincerest. Okay. No, no, but it's actually right, a, hu a, hu a huge monitor with 4K. Uh, which you can basically have seven windows open at once, one of them playing television if you want, um, uh, is an extraordinary productivity improvement. And yeah. my children are attempting to do these things using – it's that, like that description of golf, which is propelling a small ball around a, you know, a course using implements ill-suited to the project, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, the idea of golf is that the implements are entirely ill-suited to the task. And, and, and booking flights on a mobile phone is the strangest thing. I can't even imagine wanting to try to do it. Yeah. There we go. Have you? I, I, so I'm going to go down this rabbit hole, even though it's a speed round. Where we usually go through these quick. So have you heard the Robin Williams uh, monologue on golf and Scottish, how the Scottish invented it? Uh, I no, I haven't actually. Okay, all right. all right. So for our listeners and for you, after this is done, you just just Google Robin Williams Scottish golf. It is about the five minutes of the funniest <laughs> thing you have ever heard of in your entire life. It's not necessarily appropriate for uh, children. There's a cut of swearing in there, but it is fantastic. So all right, moving on. Unicycle or bicycle? Bicycle. All right. Uh, uh, that's a really weird question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> we, we go weird sometimes. Okay. You know, I, I can't make a case for the unicycle, I don't think. Um, we, have, we have had many guests who say, yeah, unicycle, give me a unicycle. Are they the ones who are kind of into juggling? And st oh, I, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. Oh. It's just the clown group that we get. Oh, so. Yeah. Okay, so which is the bigger honor, to receive an honorary doctorate or – to be on the Behavioral Group's top 10 book list of 2019. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, one of them preceded the book. Uh, the honorary doctorate is is nice, um, I have to say. Um, but uh, the, the, the popularity of the book has been very, very um, delightful to me, particularly the fact that it's proved popular with a whole group of people, for example, the investor community, which I never anticipated. Yeah, and and how did you come to know that? Oh, uh, by podcast invitations, basically. <laughs> but an extraordinary number of kind of distant – and it makes sense in – it's one of those things that makes sense in retrospect. I never would have sat out and thought, let's write this book for the investor community. But, of course, if you're looking for a different um, – point of view on the world other than the standard issue economic one then anything rather like this book which gives you the opportunity to look at things through a different lens or a different set of metrics i guess is 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 valuable to them yeah and, and have you talked to barry ritholtz uh, not yet but i know i know of him so that that might be a you know we should we should make the introduction yeah, we'll I mean, make the introduction. There's, there's a fundamental problem which I, I always reach, which is I am coming to the conclusion that capitalism works because it's essentially an intelligent system, okay, uh, which both incentivizes innovation ex and encourages experimentation and encourages diversification. Um, the idea, I am coming to the conclusion that the idea that it rewards people fairly um, I'm beginning to doubt. I think there's a huge amount of fluke going on where a bunch of people end up with a billion dollars because they happen to. Now, it's probably essential to the system that you reward luck because if you only rewarded the successes which were intended in advance, I mean, if you think about it, if we were banned from using all medical discoveries which were discovered by accident, we'd still yeah. be dying at 37. 
Okay. So yeah. the fact that you actually accept the fact that a system that funds lucky accidents is essential to the evolutionary dynamic development of capitalism. But the idea that it's particularly just um, I think in the middle, I think it, it, I think the incentive system works. I think in the extremes, it's kind of ridiculous. So I am coming to the conclusion that life is much, much more random than we think, and that various people for various political ends have imposed a kind of order on it, which doesn't, you know, which it doesn't really possess. Yeah. You know, regrettably, the ends of the curve are getting bigger now that, you know, we've got the richest yeah. of the richest and the poorest of the poor. It's becoming even more dramatic. Which is what you'd expect from globalization, I suppose, because you have this extraordinary phenomenon, don't you, which is that um, uh, the, the, the great example always given is what happened to opera singers when the gramophone was invented, yeah. which was before the gramophone. If you were the seventh best operatic tenor in Norway, you probably had a fairly decent living because, you know, the other three were busy. Uh, you know, you get enough gigs. And then suddenly everybody wanted Caruso on disc. And mm -hmm. you end up with one opera singer disproportionately. And because fame is, of course, fame is ludicrously disproportionate. I mean, it's, uh, um, the, you know, the more famous you are, the more, it, there are huge kind of runaway um, feedback loops in fame. Right. And so so the, the same thing happened apparently with books, that the average author earns the same money as they did 30 years ago or 40 years ago until you strip out Dan Brown and J.K. Rowling. <laughs> and at that point, at that point the, rest, the rest of authors basically have taken about a 30% hit. <laughs> um, you know, in the music industry, the top 1% of all artists, uh, they make as much as the other 99% combined. Sheesh. And that's just yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah. So, Rory, you have a new book, Alchemy. Tell us a little bit about what what inspired you to write the book. And then what is a kind of quick overview of what the book is about? So I suppose um, – it's written as a necessary corrective to all sorts of things which are almost axiomatic in business economics and wider decision making. I mean, the idea of kind of conventional rationality being um, deeply embedded in economics, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, and the idea, I suppose, I was describing it yesterday as a book about somebody actually wrote a very good description of the book, which is he said it's about what's important but not necessarily salient or obvious. Ah. So there are lots and lots of things going on in the world which we don't quantify or acknowledge very much, but they're still highly important. Um, uh, trust would be, you know, an obvious case, for example. Yeah. Okay. Without it, uh, you know, without trust, then um, any attempt to replicate some sort of civilized economy is pretty much impossible. And yet we don't talk about trust very much, not nearly as much as we talk about GDP. Um, but another way of looking at it is that it's about a, someone who was effectively brought up for 30 years as a creative person in an ad agency. And the nature and application of creativity as partly being spotting when you're making a decision when you're not aware of it. Now, let me explain that in a way. In that, If you decide to do anything, okay, what we think of as a decision is an area where lots and lots of people are in violent disagreement and where three people want to do X and four people want to do Y, or you yourself are deeply torn um, between doing the one thing or doing the other. Okay. Now, there are also decisions which are a bit like Sherlock Holmes's dogs that don't bark in the night. Yeah. In, the, in the Silver Blaze, it's a glorious thing. Uh, Holmes spots the fact that the crime was probably an inside job because there was a dog at the stables, but it didn't bark. Now, asking why did the dog bark, oh, look, the dog barked, therefore it was probably a stranger, that's – you know, that's a reasonable thing to do, but a lot of people could do that. Spotting the fact that the, the absence of evidence, if you like, spotting something that isn't there requires a lot more effort and a lot more kind of, uh, you know, cognitive investment, I think. You know, it's, it's the real example of Holmes's genius, in a sense. Yes. Um, and the interesting thing there is that whenever we decide anything, there are lots and lots of things which we agonize about because we think of them as decisions. But there are also things where we make a decision without even being aware we're making a decision because the answer seems just obvious, intuitive, sensible. Okay. And 
my finding through particularly through my origins in direct marketing um where the strangest accidents would lead to extraordinarily different outcomes in terms of the response rate for in, for instance is that there are loads and loads of decisions we take very confidently very happily in the workplace or in government or policy because they seem completely logical and we don't deliberate about them for a second right and and actually we're not even aware that there's a decision to be made here because the answer seems so obvious. And in fact, there nearly always is what you might call a, you know, a red hat suggestion that you, I'll give you a little example of this. I, I never won this argument, but I still think it's an interesting argument, which is <laughs> Spotify, you pay so many dollars a month. Okay. And you get unlimited music and you can download unlimited volumes of music. And I always said to them, now, Okay, they didn't even think of that as a decision because if we can afford to give people unlimited access to music for $15 a month, what could be better than unlimited? And my perverse argument was that maybe 500 albums a month might be better than unlimited. Hmm. And the argument would be to set a gratuitous and arbitrary limit on how much music you could download, not because you necessarily enforce it, to be honest, but simply because I don't know what unlimited music's worth. It's such a kind of weird – for someone who's grown up with those CDs all over the right. place, right? Unlimited music. It's like, you know, do you want to buy my unicorn? It's just, it's a really weird question. Whereas I always thought, if you said, okay, it's 500 albums a month you can download, then the average punter does the maths and goes, hold on, 500 albums a month is $5,000, yeah. right? Okay. You know, that basically I'm getting $60,000 worth of music. That's kind of what Elton probably used to spend on CDs. You know, he would actually go. He would actually go into a music shop and just spend four thousand, five thousand dollars on CDs. Okay, but I can get Elton's CD collection basically <laughs> for like ten, fifteen bucks a month. Now, my argument was that maybe, maybe that would have been a more psychologically potent way of framing the value of Spotify than making yeah. it unlimited. No, we never got to test it. I argued with them. It was too late, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, you know. But the interesting thing was, I don't think they ever had a big debate about that. Should we make it unlimited or should we make it, you know, 100 a month? Because it's, they go, well, let's make it unlimited. Yeah, it's really interesting. So this is a different way of looking at this. So we do a lot of work, uh, both Tim and I, on with uh, companies and their incentive plans. And the opposite is actually true. So some incentive plans for their salespeople, they cap them at a, at a rate that nobody gets to, right? But there's a cap. It's a limit. It says you can't earn more than $40,000 in this quarter in this plan. And yet maybe one person gets there or nobody ever gets there. But the psychology of that, if you just say it's an unlimited plan, yeah, the, the amount that people go, oh, I want that plan versus the cap plan, even though you go – Nobody, we've we've been doing this plan for five years, and nobody has actually ever gotten to that point. Doesn't matter because psychology, the, the the psychology background of that is they're going, it's unlimited. I could, which also <laughs> which also backs up my point that the opposite of a good idea is also a good idea, which yeah. is one of my rules of alchemy. Which is we've we've made this mistake, I think, and I think behavioral scientists have made the mistake that they're looking for generalizable rules. Yes. And the model, of course, is high school science, where there's a single right answer, and you show you're working out, and you get a big tick. And if you don't have the right answer, then you are wrong, okay? <laughs> now, because of the quirks of psychology, the opposite of a great idea can also be a great idea. Mm. And the, the story I always tell to advance this is the two best hotels I've ever stayed at are absolute polar opposites, <laughs> in that one of them was hugely opulent, and, you know, looked like a kind of, you know, it was furnished like a kind of Edwardian New Orleans bordello, you know, <laughs> with, you know, insanely elaborate furniture. The other one was a former police station in East Berlin, which had a black and white TV on the wall, which only showed the big Lebowski on continuous loop. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the hotel's still there and it still only shows the big Lebowski. <laughs> if you want to watch anything else, if you want to watch anything else, you go somewhere, you, you go and bug into the Marriott. You know, if you don't like the big Lebowski 24 hours a day, you can clear out. No, just to be clear about it, it was, um, first of all, it was brilliant because it was the most Berlin thing in the world. I don't exactly. go to Berlin looking for, the, I mean, 
uh, a friend of mine booked a Los Angelino into a very, very cool, hip London hotel, which had just opened, which was called the Hempel. And his two Los Angeles creative director guests were kind of gutted. And he was going, well, it's kind of like the coolest hotel in London. And they go, yeah, but it's like a cool hotel in Los Angeles. We want hunting prints and horse brasses, <laughs> you, know, and, you know, and a guy behind an overwrought kind of bar called Mine House who's pulling <laughs> pipes with a bloody, you know. And, of course, he was – and you can make that mistake so easily, which is failing to understand context. I mean, the funniest thing I ever made, which is uh, one of my most embarrassing moments, is I go to a – speak at a business conference in Mexico and all the time I think I'm going to Mexico. It's going to be quite hot. Mexico, Mexico. What do you dress? What do you wear to go to Mexico? Okay. And so I turn up in this white suit, right? Now, what I forget is that people in Mexico don't wake up in the morning and go, I'm in Mexico, right? Because that's where they live. And they all woke up thinking, I'm going to a business conference, and they put on dark suits. So you have this photograph of all of us at the end of the event. And I look like the man from Del Monte, basically. <laughs> there are 57 people in dark suits. There's me in the middle of this kind of like white thing, looking like a Canadian era governor from somewhere. Okay. You just and wanted to stand out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assumed everybody had been white suits because I was kind of thinking, it's Mexico. And um, it's so easy because and this is why the opposite of a good idea can also be a good idea, which is if you flip the context, if you flip the expectation, the frame of reference, whatever it may be, Okay. And the, the classic example in government I always give of this is that putting the limits to how much you can put into a tax free plan, putting the annual limits up can reduce propensity to save in mm. some conditions. Now, there's some very interesting people. Luca De, um, Delana does work on this called fence theory. Um, but the interesting thing is if you can only save £3,000 a year, people who can save two think I better put two in this year because otherwise I've missed my allowance for that year. Yeah. Okay. So it gives them a bit of an impetus to put one and a half, two, maybe on a good year, they'll put in three. Okay. Because they go, well, I don't want to, you know, turn my back on this tax break. Once you make it 20, hugely motivating to hedge fund managers because they can put in for them themselves, their wife, their, there's even a kiddie version you can have of the ISA. But for someone who can only save £2,000 a year, it, it destroys the impetus because they've no longer got a target to aim at. And they go, well, solid, I'll just leave it for eight years and then put in 10. And, of course, they don't, you know. Yeah. And so understanding that kind of thing in which the way in which the design of things like interfaces can have extraordinary effects and sometimes extraordinary opposite effects depending on context. But that thing, I mean, I, you know, I kind of agree with those people with behavioral science who say, look, this is just an, this is a science because it's an area of inquiry. It's not science because you're ever going to actually develop universal rules. But what we will do is we'll just spot patterns. Now, yes. I mean, it's worth remembering that, you know, monumental geniuses like Murray Gelman, when they moved from the study of physics to the study of complexity, they effectively did so, and they said candidly, look, when we're studying complexity, don't expect us to come out with some formula that explains everything, because we're not even sure that this field delivers this. It's kind of like meteorology, where you just get better at certain things. But mm -hmm. if what comes out of this science is that things that look perfectly logical and therefore aren't even accorded any thought deserve quite a lot of consideration, that people look at things that seem obvious and go, what if, what if the opposite were true? What if actually reducing the amount you could save provided a greater impetus to saving? If that's if that's what happens, then it's a valuable science. Yeah, absolutely. Even if all it says is you need, I mean, the great example of you need to test is always pricing. So I've asked, you know, pricing experts, do you do what we call round pound pricing, which is, you know, two pounds, three pounds, you know, jam, two pounds, you know, three pounds, et cetera. Okay, or do you do um, Don Draper pricing, which is one ninety nine, or do you do Primark pricing, which is you make it seem really, really cost competitive by pricing the jam at one pound seventy four? Where you know, in, in other words, uh, you know, th um, uh, transport cafes in the UK, you know, popular with truck drivers, van drivers, you will see that kind of thing. It will be you wouldn't you you know you wouldn't see it in a New York restaurant. 
um, you know, full English breakfast, uh, £4.73. But right. they, I mean, they probably wouldn't do that. The full English breakfast would probably be four ninety nine or something like that. But something like a bacon sandwich might well be two pounds thirty seven or one pound ninety eight. Right. And the whole point is that, that this is just cost plus stuff. We're not trying to maximise revenue in any other way. And so you can communicate value in all three ways. And the only answer I've ever got is, look, uh, it makes a huge difference, but we can't find any generalizable rules. Yeah. Yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. You know, at least you know what you don't know. Whereas I think what happens is people are going around thinking they know much more than they do. (laughs) So before we started recording, you said that you've been thinking a lot about ergodicity. Uh, Can you tell us what's on your mind about ergodicity? Well, I think it's an interesting notion, which is that maths is different, Um, dimensionally different depending on how you look at the world. And so, for example, to take a very simple example, averages are a very bad way of looking at the world, I would argue, Mm. that there's a huge difference between 100 people smoking one cigarette a day and uh, one person smoking 100 cigarettes a day. You know, know, there are a number of people who for $10 million would play Russian roulette once, but nobody would play Russian roulette 10 times in a row. Right. And the point of ergodicity is something that was spotted in 19th century physics by, I think, Boltzmann, if I've got my 19th century physicists right. <laughs> um, could be someone completely different, to be honest. Um, you know, somebody will Google that and check you out. So I know, they will go. check me out. Um, um, but the, they spotted this fact that actually an awful lot of probabilistic mathematics depends on assumptions of ergodicity, which aren't safe. An ergodicity is essentially there's no path dependency and that one times 10 is the same as 10 times one in those conditions. Mm -hmm. And the physicists have recently spotted uh, Murray Gelman, Ole Peters, a bunch of people at the London Mathematical Laboratory, um, that economics didn't really spot this distinction and built its Mm -hmm. whole house of cards on kind of early 19th century statistical mechanics before people had understood this distinction. I I hope I've got that all right, because I'm right at the edge of my maths envelope with this. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, (laughs) (laughs) but, but I think it's really important because there are lots of things where decisions are taken by looking at an average and by looking at a snapshot, and by assuming that what's good for the average is good for everybody within it, for example. Uh, That's one assumption. Uh, I don't think government is very good at looking at individual behavior over time. It tends to look at aggregate groups. Now, what's fascinating to me is the very fact that maths is different depending on your point of view. So there are various statistical bets where... um, Uh, The bet is, on average, good for everybody who participates every time they participate. But over time, nearly everybody who takes this series of bets gets poorer. And Mm. only very, very few people get richer. And I think understanding, you know, if you look at GDP, for example, it assumes um, that what's good for an an economy and average is therefore good for the populace. Now, theoretically, you could have a country where GDP was falling where everybody was getting richer in the course of their life, by the way. Mm. And you could equally have the opposite. Now, those are unlikely conditions, but it's not impossible. Um, Now, the interesting thing there is you get various things. I'll give you a lovely example, which I spotted. And I think Ole, I always tell Ole, look, for God's sake, tell me why I'm talking bollocks here, because as I said, (laughs) this is, you know, way outside my pay grade mathematically. Um, For a long time, throughout the UK, it was viewed as good news that house prices were rising. And every time house prices went up a lot, it was presented on the news, as it was in your news, as a Mm -hmm. great news story. And of course, when house prices rise, inarguably, average wealth increases. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you look at it from from a single player viewpoint, for 90% of your adult life, you want house prices to stay flat maybe to grow a tiny bit just to get yourself out of water a little bit, okay? But actually, most of the time, you're either thinking of buying your first house or you're trying to upgrade to a slightly bigger house or a lakefront house. Now, when house prices rise, the gap between no house and one house, one house and bigger house, bigger house and lakefront house increases, making it more expensive to upgrade, okay? The only time in your life 
when rising house prices actually deliver good news is when you decide to downsize or move into some sort of retirement home at the end, or if you're hoping for your parents to die because they live in a <laughs> vast brownstone somewhere, okay? But for most people, most of the time, you want house prices to be fairly stable. And that rising house prices were actually very, very painful for people under the age of 55 and ludicrously beneficial to people at the age of 70 or 80, say. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who then get so cranky they won't leave. So it's pointless <laughs> anyway, by the way. So you know, you'd think, wouldn't you, that all these people who've got no money but are sitting in a five bedroom house worth two million dollars, you'd think they'd sell and spend the money on like, you know, drugs and well, you know, you know, just, you know, whatever. I, okay. They don't no, they sit <laughs> on their own in a five bedroom house for whatever whatever crazy reason. I mean, uh, but but the extraordinary thing about that is that was a failure to understand that what was good for an economy averagely was actually very, very um, unfortunate in terms of it didn't spot the fact that there was a huge wealth redistribution from the young to the old going on. Every time property prices went up, you were effectively putting the young in hock to pay for the retirement of the old. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if this is the same in England, but I know in the in the US my wife is in real estate and so the the age that people are buying their oh. first home has mm -hmm. gone up. I mean, oh, it used yeah. to be in their you know late 20s, mm -hmm. early 30s, now it's getting mid 30s, early 40s. So you people are renting longer, they're staying at home longer, and they're not investing in in oh. that because of that exact thing that you're talking about they're priced out of the market for a, a starter home. It's now $230,000 in the yeah. Minneapolis. And I think what's interesting about that is that the reason nobody spotted this problem is because there are large areas, there are large areas of business and there are large areas of government, which don't really have a marketing function. Mm. And it suddenly occurred to me that for all the faults of marketing, there's an awful lot of wank in marketing. Okay? <laughs> Total rubbish talked in marketing a lot, an awful lot of the time, as a result of which it doesn't always have huge credibility, and maybe it doesn't always deserve it. But for all those faults, I think the marketer is still looking at his business through the eyes of a consumer, an individual consumer experiencing that business over time, whereas the person in the board meeting is looking at a balance sheet or some other spreadsheet, which is looking at the business through the... Um, what you might call the, you know, the aggregate snapshot. And therefore, if you have major decisions with no marketer present, you can make really, really dumb decisions in the same way that if you're an economist, you can make really dumb decisions by assuming that something that's actually good in aggregate is necessarily good in time series. And I think, so, so the fact that actually maths changes with your, with context and with point of view um, where people tend to look at maths as if it's a kind of um, you know, uneradicable, unambiguous truth. You know, here is, I mean, pov poverty and wealth inequality figures are really weird there because everybody thinks they're objective. And A, you can tell a totally different story just by choosing two different points. You know, choose a different start point and a different end point, and you can tell any story you like pretty much. But worse than that, actually, of course, it's predicated on the assumption that the people in the top 5% stay there in earnings and the people in the bottom 5% stay there. Now, actually, what you see is that movement through your life between being in the top 5%, uh, you know, typically you start off earning less than you do when you're older. It'd be yeah. kind, of, kind of weird if you did, wouldn't it, you know, uh, because you do gain experience and, and all manner of other things. But um, the idea that actually, as I said, I mean, I, I made this point that we've got a very left-wing party proposing to put very high rates of income tax for anybody earning £80,000 a year or more. And I said that doesn't just affect the 5% of people who are earning £80,000. It affects the other 25% of people who are hoping to do so one day. Yeah. So there's not much point in training as a surgeon. You know, if you don't plan one day to make 80,000 a year. Now, at the moment, a trainee medic might technically be in the poorest 20% of the population. He's hugely indebted through education. He's not earning very much. No one would think of him as poor in the sense that his prospects are fabulous. But nonetheless, statistically, he would he might well appear in the poorest 20%. Yeah. And you therefore expect him to go, that's brilliant, they're taxing the rich. But on the other hand, 
what was the point of becoming a surgeon if I can't make significant amounts of money at some point? And so, so I think that business of, of the way in which we cut data and the, and the direction or the dimension in which we look at it can then tell completely different stories is something we need to be really, really alert to because people, people tend to regard anything on a pie chart as if it's holy writ. And I think this is, you know, quite disturbing. Yeah, you know, it is. And this is the world that we're living in right now. Uh, we're we're putting more and more emphasis on the data, the big data stuff, mm. and it's which is in turn putting a burden on those who are doing the job presenting it. It also makes it possible to post-rationalize almost anything. So oh. if you have an emotional predisposition towards any kind of tax policy, you can basically cut data to support your view or, you know, or cherry pick data. I mean, the most interesting guy in this area was a guy who was called, um, I think it's Cooperthwaite, um, John James Cooperthwaite, who was the economic minister, chief economic minister for Hong Kong throughout the, I think, late 60s and 70s, who okay. fascinatingly, he banned the collection of um of economic statistics because he thought they just encouraged people to interfere. <laughs> and he, he was asked, so he, he was probably, there are various Hong Kong billionaires who are kind of, who venerate this man because they think he was kind of the architect of Hong Kong's prosperity. And to some extent, the architect of China's prosperity, you know, in that Hong Kong provided a kind of lesson there. But he, he went to a conference on developing economies and said, is there a single thing you can do which would most improve the economic prospects of my country? And his answer was, close down the Office of National Statistics. Ah. Wow. And his argument is that I suppose that we're so bad at distinguishing signal from noise and we, we exhibit so much confirmation bias in leaping on signal rather than noise that – Essentially, pretty much any statistics will provide a license for a government to intervene in the economy in a way that is, on balance, more likely to be um, bad than good. Well, and or going to whichever party is in power to their their uh, element of. Uh, perspective, right? So if I'm if I'm on leaning right, I can find the mm. whatever I, I I want to to prove my point. If I'm leaning left, I can find whatever I want to prove my point there. And you get this: the reality of the world is not being actually represented because you're cutting data in such a way to show the slice in the preferential way. Uh, oh, it's absolutely right. Yeah, and I think. Um, uh, th that danger, which is that um, pretty much anybody can make now a scientific case out of what is really a wish list um, or a belief, uh, is actually a case where we have to be really alert to this. And of course, it then extends into things like AI, where uh, or algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, as a Brit, my favourite um, example of bias in an algorithm uh, is Google Maps. And okay. the, re the reason for this is Google Maps is designed by Californians, okay? Now, and so they basically have imposed a Californian mindset on the rest of the world's transportation because it, the Californian doesn't understand the concept that you drive to a railway station and then board mass transit. Yeah. Okay? Because if you've got a car, you drive there unless it's – seven hours away in which case you fly but I mean you know but it's not quite as simple as that but I mean but the interesting point is that if if you ask Google Maps how I get from for example a county what would be equivalent Connecticut for example into into the middle of Manhattan it right. would give me a public transit answer which involves three buses to the station from my house and then a train which takes about two and a half hours and it would tell you also a driving version which would take two and a half hours because you get stuck in traffic in Manhattan or whatever. But yeah, and, and those are not mutually exclusive. But they're not, they're not, emphatically not. You can get in your car, drive as far as you can towards a railway station on the outskirts of, of New York, and then take the train in. And that probably takes you half the time and is also inordinately less frustrating than either of the other two options. But the Californian mindset in terms of what you optimize, it never occurred to them to do this, which is really weird. Well, and you bring up in your book, I love the, the component you bring up in your book in, in regards to, yes, it gives me the fastest time, but knowing that this travel from point A to point B is fastest right now, but 
there's a likelihood that something could happen on that road. That's where the traffic happens. And if I took this other route, which at this point might be 10 minutes longer, but I know for sure that I will get there in 40 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes, I am much more likely to say, do I take that risk of getting there 10 minutes earlier, but potentially being stuck in a traffic jam and being an hour late or not. And you said that was an interesting aspect. I thought that you yeah. mentioned in your book. So, so I think this is important by the way, because one of the things economics assumes is that we're trying to optimize something. And in a non-ergodic environment, it pays off just to reduce variance. Yeah. And of course, I, I, what Nassim Taleb would say, I suspect is that <clears throat> when you go on a slightly slower back road, uh, one thing that does happen on motorways in the UK is you get a fatal accident and then the police for forensic purposes have to close the road and you can be stuck there for an hour and a half. That doesn't happen very often, but if you've got a plane to catch, it's probably not worth that risk. It's far better mm. to set off 30 minutes earlier. You then go on a road that takes 25 minutes longer on average, but there are two things it's got. One, it's not going to be closed for two hours. Two, you've got optionality. Because one of the problems with with the interstate is you can have literally, you know, well, I, I mean, sort of Arizona interstate, you might have 15 miles between intersections. Exactly. So if something goes wrong, you're significantly delayed and there's nothing else you can do about it. Whereas on a back road, you can nearly always double back and, you're, and the combination of memory and sat-nav will find a, an alternative route. So a really clever sat-nav would actually ask, are you more interested in optimizing journey time um, or or are you interested in minimizing variance? In other words, if you have a hard stop or deadline, uh, variance reduction might be more important than um, opti simple optimization. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I, so it, it, it's very interesting because what we don't do when we use technology to help us make decisions, uh, we tend to assume somehow uh, we tend to become, I suppose it's an example of Daniel Kahneman's idea of whizziati, which is what you see as all there is. Um, yeah. and I, it worries me. And I was talking to a group of people at a, uh, at an online car dealership, a dealing website, um, the other day that in a way, when we buy houses in the standard online way, we think, okay, this is finding me the perfect house because each time I put in a criterion, and every time it eliminates those properties which don't meet my criteria and it optimizes those criteria I care about. But actually, A, the order in which you input the criterion has a huge effect. But B, if you look at real human decisions, we don't – I mean, if you look at who you married, for example, or whatever it may be, okay, we actually make a whole series of trade-offs. You might get to a car dealership and think that the only thing that matters is fuel economy, but there's a slightly uneconomical car there that has white wall tires or whatever it is, or contrasting leather piping. And basically you go, ah, I thought economy, officially in my conscious brain, economy was really important, but compared to contrasting leather piping, it's <laughs> shit, okay? I'll happily pay a bit more every month, you know, for you know, whatever bit of you know, picnic tables in the back. Cup holders, <laughs> of course. In, in the United States, cup holders are the major criteria, not the end It's a, a big thing. Yeah, it's a big yeah. thing. Do you, know, do you realize this, by the way, that the reason Volkswagen – for many, many years, sold so few cars in the US is that the German engineers at Wolfsburg refused to put cup holders in cars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this is the extraordinary thing, because in Germany, in, in fairness, of course, okay, if you drive a manual, the cup holder is less valuable than an automatic, and Europeans tended to drive manual cars. Um, I, I'm a long-time convert to the automatic transmission, but a lot of Europeans aren't. Um, but also Germans, you can't have a drive through basically in Germany. It doesn't work. drive through McDonald's, drive through KFC doesn't work because something like 70% of Germans won't have food or drink in the car under any circumstances. <laughs> and so um, you know, a lot of them balk at bottles of water. So patently selling a KFC bargain bucket to a German to eat in the car is going to be a pretty tough ask. <laughs> but, um, but the interesting thing there is that um, uh, – we, we actually reassess the relative importance of our criteria all the time when we're making a human decision. And so the person you married probably ends up having two criteria you would never have factored in at all. Right. Um, had you gone through some, you know, ritualized process of elimination by attribute. And, and so with property, for example, I, I, you know, when I moved out of London, I thought, well, obviously, we were in London, you're going to buy a house. And because I didn't use a website – 
because I actually discovered it in a newspaper. I went, that isn't the house, but it's a shit hell, you know, it's a really kicking flat. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, you know, we all will, any of the criteria, you know, number of bedrooms or, you know, all those things, we'll, we'll compromise on those criteria if anything's particularly strong in another dimension. Mm-hmm. And so it worries me that forcing people, when everybody, markets are intelligent because they aggregate lots and lots of irrational preferences um, through a process of revealed preference, I guess, into a lot of information about what really matters in the car industry. And so, you know, the American preference for cup holders gets factored in, you know, to brands like Jaguar, which were historically, you know, a 1970s Jaguar wouldn't have anywhere you could put a drink. Okay. Now, if everybody buys cars formulaically, all that information actually gets lost. And so the individual decisions may feel and look more intelligent but the market is aggregating less information because it's all coming to it in a kind of pre-digested form. And, you know, so for example, it's, you know, all airline websites assume that price is a big thing. All rail websites tend to assume it's about speed. And even in those fairly obvious things, we make trade-offs. You know, most people would rather take a two-hour train journey where you can sit on the same train all the time rather than get there in an hour and a half but have to change trains and stand on a platform for 15 minutes. You know, Absolutely. there are an awful lot of, of, of other factors. And if you rank things and eliminate things by a particular criterion, the real subtleties of information about human preference, which you can't really garner from research because people don't fully know either. It's only when you're presented with the choice that you really know what you want. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, and that's getting lost. Yeah, and I think that's the key piece of this is when you're in that cold state, putting in your pieces of here's what I find are important. We don't, as humans, really understand what makes us happy. I mean, there's been plenty and plenty of research. We think this will make us happy, and when we get this, it actually doesn't. And so, the fact of that is going out to look at a house. You know, I want three bedrooms, I want two baths, I want all of this. You could have that perfect house, but if it's next to a railway station, it, you know, if you didn't put that into the criteria yeah. and you have a train running by every 15 minutes and it's loud as hell, that isn't the house that you want. Versus you could find a house that maybe only has two bedrooms and it's perfect, ideal. But because you said three, it, it isn't in that algorithm to find it. And nearly everybody will, you know, with, with who they marry, the car they buy, the house they buy, will make trade-offs for anything that's particularly strong. In, I mean, the classic example I always give of this, which is we don't make decisions. A friend, a friend of mine phrases this as humans don't understand humans. Yeah. And so if you're an ad agency and you're pitching to a client, they have this balanced scorecard on which they evaluate your pitch. And mm-hmm. it will include things, it will include subjective things like personal chemistry, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it will also, you know, basically say strategy, creative work, uh, you know, capacity to deliver, blah, blah, blah. And it's always handed out by the procurement department who are desperate to create the illusion that these decisions are arrived at through some mathematical process. <laughs> but if you get a client who's been through that process, if you get them mildly drunk and say, you never actually use that to make the decision, do you? They go, no, of course I don't. I decide, <laughs> I decide who I want to win, and then I backfill the numbers so my decision makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that whole idea of how Darwin made a decision, or what is it, Franklin's rule, about totting up positives and negatives, no one really does that. Um, and, and I mean, why they don't is a really interesting question. But there's something going on there where the way we make decisions and the way computers think we should make decisions – uh, while it, and one of the things I'm saying with this car group is, look, if you've got a bunch of people looking for uh, high-end luxury cars, okay, um, you know, that are 20 years old, right, they're never going to look for a Volkswagen. But if you've got people looking at 20-year-old Bentleys, maybe you should just spring the the Volkswagen Phaeton, which is Volkswagen's bizarre um, <laughs> An actually rather successful attempt to produce a super luxury, I think it's a W12 uh, engine, and God knows what else. Okay. But wow. a, a, a good Rialto site should spring surprises on you. Yes. And actually, a good human Rialto will do this. Up with the most extreme case. Okay. You won't believe this, right? So, David Ogilvy, 
um, uh, was terrified of flying. So he crossed the Atlantic by ship, intended to go to Paris in the 1960s, I think possibly the early 70s, to buy a townhouse in Paris because he wanted to retire there. And the estate agent, uh, the realtor, the French realtor, he, to be honest, I've always wondered whether he was basically lying through his teeth here. But he, when David o arrived, he said, unfortunately, while you were on the ship, the house you were looking at in Paris um, sold. But I've got something else to show you. And he took David Ogilvy on what then must have been before high-speed trains in France, something like a seven-hour train ride to the outskirts of Poitiers, where there was a 12th-century castle with about 40 rooms for sale. <laughs> and he sold it to him. Oh, oh. my gosh. Now, now I, I mean, I, I must admit, I, you know, I would have been, I, you know, I would have been going, I was kind of looking for the Paris townhouse, mate. I mean, you know, but, but <laughs> astonishingly, and of course it then turned out to be in a sense, you know, David Ogilvy's great project uh, for, you know, the, the last sort of 15, 20, 25 years of his life was restoring the chateau and, um, uh, you know, furnishing it, uh, reveling in the history of it. Um, he was chairman of Ogilvy. To bear in mind, you had this, the chairman of this huge international company was running the whole thing from a castle and deep in the French countryside to such an extent, by the way, that his volume of post was so high that the local postman got a promotion and a new van. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was a case where at no point was David, the, most, the other extraordinary case was David, in housing was David's business partner, an extraordinary guy called Jock Elliott, who is an American of Scottish extraction, hence hence the Jock. Uh, he'd been a kind of uh, U.S. naval guy during the Second World War. He was actually present at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which I think was the biggest naval battle in world history, interestingly. But he was this extraordinary, and presumably, I know he was hired for the same... The, the same salary as the uh, the opening batsman for the Yankees or something. So he must have been extraordinarily well paid. And he moved to Scotland intending to buy a castle. And they rented a croft while they went castle hunting. And after about five months or something, he and his wife said, while you're living in a croft, you can actually go and hang out with the locals and, you know, uh, they'll, you know, they'll ferry you places on the boat and you can go and get drunk with them in the evenings or whatever. So, if we move to a castle, we won't be able to do that anymore because we're the guys in the castle. So this guy moves over to Scotland with a budget of about, I don't know, he must have had a budget of like a million and a half dollars or something like that. He could have bought anything. And he ended up buying a small croft. <laughs> and so, and so the idea of the idea of stable preferences, okay, yes, is, is so kind of absurd. I always, I, I've never met. I met David Ogilvy. I never met Jock Elliott, but I always really, really loved him for that because I thought, what a guy, you know, to go there with that budget where you could effectively buy anything you wanted, and then to buy a modest home. He did buy. He bought it. I think the island of Staffa for his wife as a wedding anniversary present. And she owned it for a day, and then he gave it to the Scottish National Trust. Um, so, so extraordinary. I'm really, really interesting guy. And tragedy, I would have loved to have met him just to talk about property. But yeah. um, that, that's a really interesting thing. When you've got a budget to do anything you want, and you do something really modest. What a, what a fascinating guy. And we always like to end our discussions with a little chat about music. And I uh, was wondering if you've got a bit of, of time that we could talk about that. With you. I, I just make sure it's, 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 it is not me. It is you. But but I, I, I go along. OK, let's start with what's on your playlist. Oh, um, uh, I've been meaning to get that extraordinary recording of there's a film just released of Aretha Franklin in 1971 uh, with, I think, the Southern, Southern California Community Choir. Uh, and I've been meaning to watch that film because. Aretha was pretty cranky about licensing things. And so throughout her lifetime, she continually refused to, uh, the, the, the audio release happened years ago, but the video release uh, only happened, I think, uh, a few months after her death. Hmm. Um, and I've been meaning to watch that, but I can't remember what it's called, but it, uh, um, if you Google it, uh, that's that's the, the thing on my intention list. Oh, you have uh, to get it. I, I'm a huge amazing. fan, by the way, I'm a huge fan of the, th um, I, I always think it's very interesting that there are, th that the best of any music genre is very good. 
Okay. But there are three music genres which people tend to reject because they're the music genres with the worst signaling value in metropolitan circles, which are metal, gospel, and country. And so I always see those as the three really underrated uh, music genres. Um, now, patently, the very best of gospel, given the music talent involved, is going to be spectacular. I mean, yeah. in the congregation for this concert with Aretha singing are Mick and Keith from the Rolling Stones, okay? That's the church they went to um, every time they were in L.A. Um, ah. Okay? So, I mean, given, the, you know, given the talents involved and the talent available, patently these things are going to be extraordinarily good, and yet people reject them. Uh, country I like a lot. I've been catching up a bit on George Jones recently. Um, uh, also classical, I'm a huge Bach nut. Um, and actually, that extends to the wider family as well, JC and uh, CP and so on. Um, and I'm very interested, too, in looking at the extent to which um, composers often fall out of favour. Uh, I'm intrigued by musical fashion because... If you think about it, recorded music now dates back to, I guess, I mean, the 1920s is probably the first tolerable recording quality. Uh, yeah. The 30s got a bit better. But, but, but my children, what fascinates me with my kids is they don't really, and this is, I think, a product that, that um, partly of Spotify, but they're, the periods of music to which they listen are extraordinarily eclectic in terms of the um, uh, so they they don't see anything weird with listening to something completely contemporary, some bit of rap, and then flipping to ABBA. And then they're occasionally completely surprised because my wife and I know the words to songs, which came out <laughs> when we were like 23. They go, how do you know the lyrics to this song? And go, because it came out when we were 23. <laughs> um, and, and so there's something fascinating there, which is, you know, will we actually see – if you look at classical composers, Bach sunk into, sunk into complete obscurity, really, uh, in most of the 19th century until being rescued by Mendelssohn. Um, there are a whole load of sort of Handel operas which weren't performed between his death and the 1960s. I was just wondering, are we going to see, you know, really strange musical revivals? You know, I, I, I don't know. So, you know. Are young people suddenly going to get into big band music or... You know, something of that kind. You know, one thing I did do, which took me a bit of behavioural science thinking before I did it, was I realised I'd spent the last 20 years agonising about how to download music and how to acquire it, um, almost at the expense of listening to it. Mm. I, I did buy this year for the first time a reasonably expensive bit of audio equipment, which is the first time I'd spent more than sort of $500 on audio equipment. Because if you think about it, the hi-fi market for about 20 years was totally sidelined, wasn't it? You know, in the 1980s, before the internet, I had rich friends who'd go on about, you know, you know they, they got some, you know, it, typically you'd have a Lin Son deck, uh, a name amplifier, and then maybe some electrostatic quad speakers, and then connected by, you know, speaker cables that cost £100 a foot that were yeah. hand-woven by Austrian elves or something like <laughs> that. And... I suddenly realized nobody, the iPhone came along and the iPod came along and everybody basically, you know, listened to stuff on headphones and they thought this is amazing, got tons and tons of music. And nobody really spent any money on reproducing it other than headphones. Yeah. And I went and bought this name thing called the, the Muso because they brought out a new version, which is about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300. And as a result, the earlier version was being sold off for about 600 and I thought, okay, 600 is a lot to spend on what is a wireless Bluetooth plus internet speaker and radio, but it's a massive, great single speaker. And I suddenly realized, look, what's crazy is that there's probably some mental thing going on, which is when someone had a £3,000 or £4,000 CD collection, it seemed only sensible to spend 2000 or £3,000 on the equipment to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly did this reframing, which said, well, I've now got access to all music and all of the world's radio stations. I listened to quite a lot of American classical stations, um, uh, WFMT Chicago, that kind of stuff, okay? Um, K-I-N-G, King FM in Seattle. There's some very good American classical stations. 
which you can listen to in fairly high bandwidth streaming. I said, oh, well, look, okay, the fact that this has become cheaper has also meant that I'm spending less on equipment. But look at it another way. When you've got access to all the music in the world, you should actually spend commensurately more on reproduction equipment. Yes. yes. And I've noticed something similar happening. I think there's a mistake in advertising, which is a similar thing, which is because media has become cheaper and cheaper because it's digital and it's highly targeted, people spend less on creative. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, and there was always this kind of rule of thumb that you spent on producing an advertisement 10% of what you spent on broadcasting it. And yeah, I, and I think it's an entire mistake. I think, I think we've just, uh, uh, that, that there's something going on here where we need to rethink this. Because actually, when the delivery mechanism is cheaper, arguably the content needs, needs to demonstrate costly signaling more, not less. Because the costly signal's no longer being delivered by the fact that it's a 30-second TV commercial or in the Super Bowl or whatever it might be. Yeah, well, you know, there's a couple of countervailing things about this. I mean, one, we are continuously spending more and more yeah. on televisions to enhance our viewing experience. Uh, and, but we're still listening to speakers that are just crap at home. You know, uh, yet in the automobile, we're willing yeah. to spend exorbitant amounts, you know, for better sound in the car, and but not in our home. And I think this is a curious inconsistency i suppose you can play it really loud in your car but the, the quality is never going to be as good as it can be at home oh, um uh, there is that problem of course at home which is that you set the thing to play at whatever volume you choose and then your wife comes in and turns it down two notches if you notice <laughs> so for, and then your kids come in and turn it up five notches. Up five notches exactly so <laughs> there is that volume battle which which was by the way there's always a battle in temperature as well because apparently um women always prefer a room to be about two degrees higher than men do mm. it's very rare to have a couple who are basically in a, in alignment in terms of room temperature because um, men have larger livers in proportion to body size, so I think guys tend to run a bit hot. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> going back, going back to the music thing and, and spending that amount on the equipment, I, I'm wondering if there's actually. So you you had mentioned in the book too the placebo effect and like mm. you know why are we charging so little for aspirin when we should charge yeah. a lot for aspirin because you're going to get this larger placebo effect, and the 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 research that has been done on wines where they've done the blind taste test and it's the exact same no, wine but if you say it's an expensive wine it tastes oh. better they do the neurological fMRI studies which show it actually lights up different areas of your brain so it's actually your actually feeling it not just imposing it couldn't the same thing happen with music right with with buying the expensive speakers you would actually hear the music better i mean i, I don't know that yeah, but no no that's I, a, I, no i think you do and i think that's absolutely true because um uh you hear things in music when you play it in different forms yes. which are more or less inaudible to you on even pretty good headphones um that i think that is interesting um, but it, it, no, it fascinates me that because it struck me that logically, once you had the capacity to download in pretty lossless formats, pretty much anything you wanted for a low cost, logic would really say that you ought to spend commensurately more on the reproductive <laughs> equipment. And yet we seem to spend less. And um, I don't regret buying mind you, We never regret buying anything, do we? That's extravagant. No. I mean that. I mean that that business of adaptive preference formation. Where I mean, this is a really interesting thing about the opposite of a good idea being a good idea. And I keep saying this: that you don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. Okay, <laughs> you, you get you get a thrill from a bargain. Okay, and you get a thrill from an extravagance. And when you when you do anything extravagant, you tend to do a lot of adaptive preference formation, where your attention is disproportionately drawn to the aspect of this expensive thing which is superior. And therefore, yes. because it attracts your attention, it becomes more important to you. And therefore, what should be possibly an extravagance we regret. I mean, that was a bit of advice given to me by someone in catalog retail back in the nineteen um, uh, in the late nineteen nineties, where she said, "You never regret your extravagances." And I always think there's something there that TK, TJ Maxx, you call it, of course, we call it TK yep. Maxx for complicated legal reasons. There was a, a brand called TJ's Home Stores or something at the time, which forced T, TK, TJ Maxx to become TK Maxx in the TK. UK. <laughs> uh, it's very weird, I know. Um, but you get a thrill from that, 
okay? Because you've found a bargain and you get a thrill from an extravagance. But stuff in the middle, and this is my great argument about, you know, the opposite of a good idea is another good idea, that actually, um, that you know, sen the sensation-seeking characteristic in humans. Um, and the, the, the other example I was given was of a very, very successful Chinese restaurant in, in London's Chinatown for many years, which was famous for being the rudest restaurant in London. Yeah. And provided you were famous for being rude and people expected in advance, it was a selling point. Yes. Yeah. And, the, you know, the Berlin Hotel, which doesn't have carpets where you sleep on a platform above your shower and there's a black and white TV show. You know, again, in you know, if I turned up expecting the Marriott, it would have been the worst evening of my life, you know. Yeah. But I wanted a Berlin Hotel. And um, so this is the kind of thing where I think uh, it's very, very dangerous to try and generalize for the average because nobody wants it. I mean, this is, I mean, this right. is true of, of human body types. The guy who was d set to design cockpits for um, high-speed jets was yes. told to design an average cockpit seat. And he's in fact, effectively found that the number of people who are average on more than, t on more than about five of 12 measures of, you know, elbow, whatever it was, you know, upper arm length, knee position, whatever it might have been. Okay. Basically nobody, I think, out of thousands of people, nobody was average on more than four of these dimensions or more than five. And so what you realize is that I, it, it, this is why capitalism is necessary because, A, we don't know what we want, okay? Yep. So we only know what we want when we see it. Um, and this is, this is an extreme Hayekian view, which is not only do you need markets to aggregate the information, but until you have markets, the information isn't even extractable from our heads in any case yeah. because we can't describe what we want. But also the magical aspect of capitalism, which is it can solve a problem in more than one way. Yeah. And you can, and the magical aspect of capitalism is that, uh, you, know, um, you know, what's, I mean, one of the things I'm, you know, really fascinates me is I think, uh, you know, I, I, well, a classic example, which is very similar to that business of um, uh, of, of the the hi-fi, uh, is I wonder if if some if, if I was Zoom, right, would I get somebody like Name, okay, or a brand? I don't know if you know Name. It's a British sort of. It's actually Anglo-French premium hi-fi brand or someone like sure s-h-u-r-e you know the headphone people yeah. yeah if you got them to make really really sodding expensive video conferencing equipment that was portable would you get loads of businessmen to you know would that actually because the problem is is that we you know you have this fantastic technology which is more or less free uh, and everybody goes and buys like a 20 pound webcam yeah or you know or they you know or they and my argument is that there's something wrong here. You know that we really ought to be, you know, really investing in how you you do video conferencing really well. Well, uh, and for the business perspective, you're signaling then too. Mm -hmm. Like you are, if if you are saying that if I am in business and I have a a high. I know that this costs X number of dollars. Everybody that now comes in contact with that, oh, you have you've gone that extra distance. Yeah. So you're signaling that value that you're placing on that. So the equivalent of the Mont Blanc pen in the 1980s, where every businessman had to have. I mean, one of the hysterical things that happened with me is in the very early days of laptops, everybody in business class used a laptop on short haul flights. Nobody does that. Or there's one guy who does, who's like way behind preparing a presentation and yeah. is in a desperate panic. Nobody else does. But when the laptop was a bit of a badge of status, okay, people for totally gratuitous reasons, mid-flight would take a laptop out of their bag and type something and then put it away. It was a completely yeah. fatuous activity. Um, but no, I mean, that really interests me, which is uh, what, are, what are areas where – uh, we could transform behavior by flipping the, you know, in other words, flipping the motivation. Yeah. Um, and could you make having a 500 pound bit of video conferencing equipment, uh, you know, made by some high end audio. There is a sure thing, by the way, S H U R E, um, uh, which is a, a very high quality condenser mic, uh, which you clip onto the top of your phone. And essentially it comes with a tripod. Um, it's in my bag. I have got one. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's it's so interesting because this is this brings us back to the beginning of the conversation, which is about decisions which aren't decisions. 
Right. So everybody assumes, you know, the best thing we can do with video conferencing is to make it free. Maybe actually the problem with video conferencing is it needs to be made really expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, there may, you know, is there some Zoom premium thing which you only give to the most senior people in a company which broadcasts stuff in 4K, you know, all that stuff? Right, right. Um, and everybody assumes, you know, I mean, even Amazon, I think, is getting it wrong because I think Jeff Bezos basically goes, people want high levels of convenience, overnight delivery, and they want maximal choice. Well, I think, I think Amazon Marketplace is turning into a bloody souk. You know, there are certain categories – where you go there, you know, you want to buy a USB cable or a toaster or something, and you just go, okay, I've got price range from five pounds being posted direct from China up to a kind of dual it thing at you know nine hundred dollars. Basically, now I'm totally blinded by the headlights. What we actually want is what a shop does, which is to curate a range of toasters with yes. a reasonably sensible price range, um, and. And, I, and again, this is this is this is a, the, the paradox of choice is the classic example of something where the opposite of something is also true in the sense that in a lot of cases we want choice to be reduced, but in different contexts, as I said about the jam experiment, if you'd travelled thirty miles to visit a superstore called World of Jam, right? Because mm -hmm. you're a massive jam enthusiast, you wouldn't go into the door and go, "Oh, there's too much jam. I can't cope. I'm not going to buy anything," and drive straight home. You know, right. there, a huge range of jam would be interesting and, and so forth. But in the opposite context, actually, if you're a time-poor shopper in a crowded supermarket on a Friday, I don't doubt for a second that five kinds is better than 15. Yeah, context matters. Context really matters, yeah. Okay, so if we walk into World of Jams with 2,000 varieties, won't we still make better decisions if we're – you know, if we're looking from a curated list or 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 breaking those two thousand into smaller groups. Well, I think there's well, like like here's three that you should taste. Well, it's a curating part of it, right? Yeah. So I think that you can have that choice of two thousand, but you're curating or you're categorizing it. These are these are hot jams. These are the jams that have this yeah. you know this pepper in it that are going to be you know. And now you can compare the ten of those versus these are our our jams from you know berries that are wildly picked or something like that like we go there is a the world's not i don't know if it's the world's or at least america's largest candy store supposedly is is like 30 miles outside of minneapolis this is big yellow barn bright yellow with i'm there I'm, there I'm gonna go there i want to go there <laughs> it, it has like you walk in and it is just overload you know they have rows and rows of um uh, taffies oh, and yeah, different yeah. flavors yeah. of taffy yeah. kind of yeah. things and all that. And then you go into all the Japanese candies with all their weird, you know, so they, they do curate all of these different things, but you go there knowing that I'm going to find something that I am not going to get at my local Anywhere supermarket. No, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever I can find that green tea Kit Kat, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I always buy it. There. Yeah. 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 So, no, I mean, one of the interesting things, I suppose, is that do you model human behavior as optimization or is it regret avoidance? <laughs> you know, so Satisfy it, yeah. you know, if you look at satisfying and regret avoidance, they both give you, and also, of course, variance reduction. There yeah. are all these different tools we can use and we can develop heuristics, which do a pretty good job um, of achieving, you know, brands are a heuristic. You know, if I buy a branded good, it's not going to be a crock of shit. You know, anything yeah. with Samsung on it as a TV is going to be somewhere between pretty good and really good. And I'd much prefer that than take the risk, even if it's a 1% risk of buying a terrible television, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we devise all these little strategies for, you know, um, downside um, variance reduction because <clears throat> that's pretty important. I mean, there's a lovely thing, <laughs> which is... Um, he said Bolt, uh, for about a week or so before he competes at the Olympics in the 100 meters or the 200 meters or whatever it is, basically only eats chicken McNuggets. What? Yep. Okay. Now you talk to other people and they go, well, that's ridiculous. You should say my body is a temple. I should have, <laughs> okay. I should have, you know, I should have dietary advisors you know, mixing quinoa and kale uh, into <laughs> some blended smoothie. Now, I think the logic is really easy, which is he is, in fairness, okay, he's the best runner in the world by a margin, okay? Yeah. And his basic approach is I'm going to win 
But there are two things that can screw me up. One, not getting enough protein, basically, under eating, and two, getting ill. And by the way, it happens quite a lot because you're in a foreign country. It's all a bit weird. You're exposed to completely different you know, microbial stuff. Now, if you go to the Golden Arches, he's saying it's not going to get the shits, right? Yeah. And now, of course, there are a lot of cases of really, really promising arch- uh, uh, athletes who you know, ha- uh, there was a case, I think, in the Mexico World Cup where there were several teams who were possibly even poisoned by the hotel staff. Oh. <laughs> and so, you know, all you've got to have is a, is a soccer team with four people with um, gastric flu, and you're basically out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the that approach, which is you go, okay, my basic function is to minimize downside risk. Now, if I think if he were less good, you might argue that he might need to try. But basically his point is I'm going to win unless I screw up. And here are the two major ways I can screw up. So he's just minimizing the risk, right? Yeah, minimizing downside, because if he doesn't have any downside, he wins, basically. And th- there's no amount of quinoa that anybody else could basically consume that's going to make them faster than Hussein on a good day. So his well, job and, is and, don't have a bad day. Yeah, yeah. And it's not going to improve his performance mm. at any point that is going to n- He's going to win anyway. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so why do it? Hey, and chicken yeah. McNuggets are good chicken yeah. McNuggets, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Rory, thank you so, so much for being with us. It is, it, it's it, been an absolute joy. Really, really. It has fun. been. It's always a pleasure. Really excellent. Welcome to our grooming session where Tim and I groove on what we learned in our interview, have a free flowing discussion, and whatever else comes into our alchemized dark art and magic filled brains. You know, it was so funny when uh, when Rory decided on the name of the book, he sent me a note and said, damn it, you've already got, you know, your your business name, Behavior Alchemy, you've already got it, but, <laughs> but I'm going to name the damn book after it anyway, you know. <laughs> so oh, there this, you go. So we had this little, you know, rivalry going on. So there. you, you like, you know, you know, got be, got the idea before he did. Right I there. did. Yeah. Well, I, I put it in print before he did. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to claim having the idea. Well, okay. alchemy. Just uh, so explain yeah. to people who may not know what alchemy is. What is alchemy? It's it's an old art uh, that has been studied since the Egyptians when they were trying to figure out how to turn lead into gold. Basically, to change one thing that is common into another thing that's not common. So that dark magic. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm not dark a, art and I'm magic. Not a, I'm not a warlock. I'm just applying behavioral science. But you're what, just a wizard. That's what you are. You're I, not I, a warlock. You're a wizard around a wizard. incentives and behavioral science. My That's hope is are. that my business can take ordinary things and transform them into not so ordinary things. Well, there you go. And I think I I can attest. I've seen you do it. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you. All right. Okay. So <laughs> one rabbit hole gone down. Next Check. rabbit hole. Let's begin. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk about Rory and the discussion. What was uh, the first thing that struck you about our conversation with Rory? Humans don't understand humans. Oh, yes. <laughs> we are just so yeah. ignorant of how others respond to what we do or we think they do things because of certain things and they really don't or we make big assumptions and all of that that man we are not good at really understanding other human beings yeah i think about um i think about in the corporate world um and and this is not to blame hr uh or or marketing specifically but man when they're communicating internally they really typically do a poor job of understanding who their audience is and really understanding oh. the context in which their own employees, their fellow employees, their associates and colleagues are going to be listening to and hearing the message that they're trying to send out. And they, and they miss the boat. Oh, it's not only with their own employees. I just got a letter from my insurance company, medical insurance company, right? They're making some changes to some policy and it may or may not affect me. Oh, And but- they wrote, this whole big letter about all of these changes. And then they wrote, and here is the communication campaign that they put in a table in this letter to me that had letter to, you know, uh, me, like the participants in it, but then letter to the brokers and letter, you know, and information to, it's like, I don't care when you're sending out the information to the brokers. I'm surprised you got that far down through the letter. (laughs) Well, it was just, it was so crazy. And I'm like, they don't understand 
that's I, they're thinking about it from their perspective, which is what Rory talks about, right? Yes, and, yes, and I exactly. loved his idea about you know Google Maps being created by you know Californians. Right, who drive <laughs> everywhere? So yeah. why would you ever drive to a you train know, station? Train station to then get on a train station and have that as an option, and take the train to a subway, and then take the subway to a particular location, and then walk the last two blocks. Yeah, because that's not how our brains are, or mm-hmm. the fact that we might be more interested in having consistency. And and making sure that we are not late and that even though it might be a very small, it might not be the fastest way to yeah. get there, but it's the most consistent and, and reliable way of getting there. And so we don't always take into consideration why people are doing what they're doing. And we make assumptions about that. And that is a huge insight and one that, again, behavioral science – hopefully can help address. This is where your consultancy and my consultancy can help companies get that figured out (laughs) by doing that damn research and understanding why is is this uh, customer going to buy this product? Why is this employee going to actually make a a decision to make a a change in their life, in their corporate life? Right, and and then being able to communicate that in a way that doesn't put in the timetable for (laughs) communication that it talks about people that... I don't give a shit about. <laughs> I know. <sighs> all right, I got that off. I just held rabbit hole number two. We've got done. There well, we go. It, it's all related to, to humans don't understand humans, and I think that this is that was, that was great. I think that was, yeah. uh, you know, again, it's something we talked about on the show before. I just don't know if we've talked about it as succinctly and as you know, Rory's just. I love his stories, his insights. He just brings a unique lens into all of this, right? Yeah, he does. Yeah. Um, So next thing, what do you want to talk about? Uh, Behavioral science is, is about paying attention to things that just aren't obvious. Yes. This is, this is the magic part. This is the dark arts part, maybe. Well, and again, going back up to, you know, well, of course they're going to want to have the fastest route from point A to point B, but no, that's not the the obvious thing isn't that because we have different motivations depending on the context and where we are and various different things. Yeah. And that's what behavioral science addresses. And I loved I loved his I you know, the going back to the Sherlock Holmes uh and the, the Adventures dog, of the Silver Blaze. And, yeah. the, and the you know, the dogs don't bark in the night. And so you wrote a blog about this many years ago, right? Yeah, I so did. We're, what's the context? Set the con- set set the narrative. Tim. So Conan Doyle is classic in his you know fabulous ability to describe these situations. Right, he is the author of Sherlock Holmes for those who don't, and Tarzan, by the, the way, and Tarzan. That's right. Uh, it's, it's both. So uh, Holmes is having a discussion with Detective Gregory at Scotland Yard, and and Gregory says, um, "Hey, is there anything else that?" Um, you know, that you wish to draw my attention to. And Holmes says to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And Gregory says, Oh, but the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes says, that was the curious incident. Yes. And just so subtly tease up this idea that because the dog didn't bark, the dog must've been familiar with the person who was perpetrating the crime. Which is as Rory said, it's understanding, it's paying attention to those things that aren't obvious and that is hard, right? It it's is not incredibly intuitive. hard. If the dog had barked, the, the the inspector would have said, oh, we had the dog barking. It woke up these people. And that would have been an obvious, vivid piece that they would have then explored. But because the dog didn't bark, it just passed underneath the observation. Exactly. It and becomes a non-obvious experience because it's not vivid. It, it, it didn't actually occur. Nothing occurred. And that's the difficult thing to pay attention to. And this is, this is one of the things that I've struggled with in designing incentive programs. The number of people who are disenfranchised and simply don't participate mm. is a big unknown in the corporate world. You know, sales sales VPs are you know uh, can rest on their brilliance and uh, and tremendous uh, success by saying, "Oh, look, look at the sales that we got, and we got all these people involved, and 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 look at the results that we got with this sales contest." My question is, who didn't we get involved? Right, and who, how how not engaged are they? Yes, and how much do they not understand right. how the incentive works? So to that. Piece. It's that communication aspect of saying, well, we explained the, the communication campaign to them and we wrote it in, you know, 
uh, 30 page document and they have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what don't we, you know, how many people didn't actually read that? How many people? Or how many people read it and didn't understand it? Yeah. So they didn't engage. How many people just believed that they couldn't participate and didn't engage? Who just didn't give a flying flip and just said, I don't care about incentives? Right. We, oh, and without. That knowledge, I think you're still missing a big part of the story. And even to the point, again, we're digging down on incentives, is, you know, we talked with uh, in our, you know, just our previous interview with with Yana. Oh, uh, Yana Gallus, Gallus yeah, right? from UCLA. And she's talking about schemes and means. Well, you know what? What is the non-obvious part about the schemes? Are they even relevant to that person? And so... Are those rules and are the reward, are they going to be aligned with that person's motivation and various different things? Are they going to tap into that self-identity of who that person is? Exactly. Which is one of the things that she brought up. And so really key pieces there. And I think, uh, you know, they said spotting something, Rory said this, right? Spotting something that isn't there requires a lot more effort and a lot more cognitive investment. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. okay. What else? What else struck you in our in our conversation? I think this is your favorite part, so <laughs> I'm going to say it because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to get behavioral alchemy before you take it away from me. Um, the opposite of a good idea can be a good idea. Yeah. So again, yes. if you just listen to that and you don't really think about it, it goes, well, "What the hell does that mean?" But if you think about it, oh my gosh, it's brilliant. I love the way you actually brought up the world of jams concept because I love Sheena Iyengar's uh, study on uh, on the jam study, and I'll, I'll reference it in the show notes. But but if you it, people in the supermarket when they had the choice to make a, a decision from four jams were more likely to buy than when they had to make a choice from twenty four flavors of jam. Right, because it's too it's too much, it's too confusing. But you brought up this fabulous example of if, if I went to the world of jams, if I went to a store, Rory brought that up. Okay, I Rory, did bring it up. I thought you brought it up. Actually. No, Rory. Brought but if it up. there were you know two thousand different flavors of jams, if they were curated properly, that could be a great experience to have all that choice. So yeah, I think the interesting piece is oh, the world of jams is you're in a mindset to go there, right? Yeah. So so that's going to be it. But the interesting piece that I think the, that I was going after is, all right, so within the store, if we took within the store and we had and we were able to differentiate those 24 jams into six categories of jams. Right. You know, the these spicy are, ones. These are the, yeah. the, these are the crazy wacky ones. These are the fruity, you know, berries, dark berries. These are your red berry ones. You know, could you, would that then change? the the way that we process that so that it doesn't have that cognitive overload. And you could still make a good decision. And you could still make a good decision. And so it's a different, again, you know, Rory was talking about the context, the context of going to World of Jams versus being in a supermarket and, and kind of how you're uh, assuming it. I'm saying, let's take a look at the at the supermarket aspect and the way that it's being presented, can we change the way that people process that? So that, yeah, that good idea of saying we need to limit choice because the paradox of choice that we, we all know about. But all right, so how can we limit that choice? Can we limit that choice by maybe obviously taking away a number of jams, but we could also limit that choice or change the way that we process it so it isn't cognitive overload by how we structure very much so that again it's going into you know what i love about going into bookstores like local bookstores uh, is those little notes that they have underneath some of the yes. the books yes. where it it's is a like staff pick. a staff pick and they talk a little bit about it because mm -hmm. I get overwhelmed with all these books, but I'm like, going, oh, there's some social proof here, mm -hmm. right? And, and it tells a little bit about this. And sometimes they say, if you like this book, you should read this book. And I'm yeah. like, going, it's the Amazon piece, but it's more personal, right? It's right. not done by an algorithm. It's done by a person. And I'm going... That, again, is a different way of, of taking that cognitive overload of having all of these books out there and being able to bring it down into something yeah. that's more manageable. You can be overwhelmed by the number of choices that you have when you're in the Hello Kitty section. I, I, I get that. <laughs> 
you read those that. Hello Kitty books? <laughs> I, you know, there you go. Uh, okay, um, what else? What else should we should we talk about here? Is there anything else that we sh- we should well, improve on? We we have to just say ergodicity because you know it's yeah, ergodicity. Oh, yeah, because it is it's a, it is a kind of a big deal, right? This this whole idea of looking at at the at data points in such a way that we can say we've got this small sample and this actually. This sample really does reflect the whole, and we can prove that by uh, we can. We, it's provable. It's provable, but it but it's also provable in the order that it's done. That's where we're going. And actually, it was interesting because we had the discussion with Ergodicity with Roy prior to actually getting live on the show, right? Right. right. And then when it would get brought up inside the show, it, it went down a whole different. Path. Path. Yeah. Um, and, you know, talking about having marketing inside of government uh, as this piece because government just looks at averages and it doesn't necessarily take into consideration the, the person. Yes. And that, I think, is a really interesting piece. And I think, again, businesses sometimes that depend on – it's the developing an incentive plan by – we're going back to incentives, right? But developing an incentive plan uh, by looking at a spreadsheet – Versus developing an incentive plan by understanding how people are motivated and how your sales reps are going to respond and Based what on, they're dealing with day in and day out yeah. inside of that territory. And that territory is actually different than these other territories. So how do you design something that fits in that as opposed to looking at, we have to grow sales by 4%. If we put a, you know, a, a kicker and a bonus on this, <laughs> right. it's going to, co- you know, right. on this, it'll cost us 3% in order to drive that 10% increase and financially it works out, which is important. Which is an important part of the discussion, but, but it, it, it also supports the humans don't, don't know, don't understand humans. Yes, humans don't understand and humans. And it goes back to that. So, there you go. Uh, yeah, so we have to do that. Okay, I have a musical question for you. All right. What aren't you listening to that you don't listen to? Oh, you beat me to the punch. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you that question. It's like the dog that doesn't bark. What, you know, the curious incident of the dog in the middle of the night. So it might... It might be that I'm not listening to things that I don't listen to because of signaling. Yeah. It might be because I have an identity that is surrounding a particular type of music and a particular sound or vibe or uh, an artist profile that I connect with. And if you, if if there's music that is not in that realm, not an artist, not the style of music, not the production of music. Not made before 1978, oh, right? <laughs> you laid that up so nice. It was such a softball thing. I, I was actually holding back. I listen you... to all kinds of new artists. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but I think that, that there might be an aspect of signaling in this, uh, in the way I exclude music because because uh, to help me curate, right? right? I'm in the world of jams. I'm not. I, I could be overwhelmed by having two thousand options, but I help self curate and limit the number of things that I'm listening to by by artist, uh, by uh, genre, things like well, that. Well, and I think you, in particular, you, because of the musical, you know, music that you make, right? And you have a persona around that music. You are a folk, you know, Americana, right? Yeah. That's your that's your thing. Uh, do you limit like the genres that you play? Is that is that limiting because this is the persona that I have with your hat and the the <laughs> the six albums that you've already created and you know the acoustic vibe that you wouldn't even you know entertain making more of a pop or new wave type electronica yeah. kind of music because it doesn't fit with your persona well, or is it just because I don't really freaking care for that music? Well, uh, it also might be the limitations that I have on my my playing ability and my vocal ability. You know, I, I couldn't pull off an Ed Sheeran song. You could just get that, what is the voice box thing? And you could pull off, you know, 90% of pop music today. What's it called? Just do a fake. No, what's the, what's the auto, auto-tune? Auto-tune? Yeah, yeah. you just okay. auto-tune everything. <laughs> wah, wah. We should auto-tune this, this podcast, by the way. We could. We could. There we, we go. We could do that. All right. <laughs> How about you? I'm going to throw it back. What are, what are you not listening to that you're not listening to? So, you know what's really interesting about that? So, I agree. There's probably some signaling, right? Right? And particularly different things. And and I wrote about this in our last newsletter, 
right, was my son listens to a whole different genre than, yeah, than I do. Right. And because he listens to it, I'm now uh, exposed to it. So it's been very interesting. So I am now listening to NF, which is a rapper who, you know, is from Detroit, reminds me of Eminem, but without the curse words and, you know, various different things. And he gets really, you know, strong emotional components that I would have never listened to before, except for my son and my daughter, you know, they're also, they're, they like, uh, both my son and daughter really like the uh, Spider-Man Into the Multiverse soundtrack, okay. um, which, again, is kind of rap and new modern pop-ish stuff that I would normally just like discount. And But it's around. It's and around. And you're listening to and it. And I'm around and I'm listening to it. So I think And are you liking some of it? Yeah, there's some of it that I like. There's some that I just find like, oh my god, you know, quit. <laughs> uh, do you have a voice? Because all you do is auto tune, and and I can, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, shit. Who who cares? Yeah, you know, yeah. It, and it all sounds like this sounds exactly the same as the. So what's the difference between this song and the other five songs that we've just heard? Well, right? the, you're gonna have to listen a lot harder because they're different. <laughs> they are different, but in. Yeah. You know, just passing, they're not. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. I don't really care because, <laughs> yes. you know, we're, we're, we're doing, this is, you know, lack of sleep and you're doing great. Things. You're there doing you great. Go. So, all right. So stay uh, tuned for a bonus track, folks. Hey, Groovers, this is Kurt with your bonus track. We always enjoy our conversations with Rory because of his laughter and ability to poke fun at so much of human behavior. But we also find his thoughts and ideas provocative and insightful. There were a few things we discussed that really caught our attention. First, we talked about humans don't understand humans. Our design efforts, whether it's with apps or policies from human resources, tend to reflect our individual biases rather than the context and conditions the users may experience. This area is ripe for improvement on a variety of platforms. Second, Rory talked quite a bit about how capitalism is not working well for the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Incentives tend to be geared to those who already can rather than at those who would like to or someday hope to. This was highlighted by the increasing disparity we see in wages between the rich and the poor. Also, the way that average publishers make about the same as they did 30 years ago once the biggest authors are excluded. And Tim brought up how the top 1% of all musicians earn as much as the remaining 99% combined. Lastly, our conversation about context was terrifically fun, and it supported the idea that the opposite of a good idea can be a good idea. We highlighted Sheena Ingar's classic jam study that revealed that grocery shoppers are better at choosing a jar of jam when they have only four options compared to 24 options. But if you went to the world of jams, you would expect, or at least hope, there would be 200 flavors of jams, and they'd be all curated by different geographies and types of flavors to help you decide. Okay, here's your groove idea for the week. We want you to think about a situation in your work life where you have to communicate with people on the other teams or with people in very different roles. While you're probably there to represent your expertise, there's also a need to think about the context for the person receiving the information. We rarely consider what their context is so that we can frame what we have to say in a way that will make the most sense to them. So we're challenging you this week to think about the context of other people you communicate with at work. Let's see how it goes. And let us know how it goes because we love hearing from you and we appreciate you sharing that information with us. And we would love and appreciate you sharing behavioral grooves with your friends and coworkers. And reach out to us on Twitter. We love talking with you, our listeners, and we will definitely respond back. So with that, thank you and have a great week. Mm-hmm.